Amen. Would you please remain standing while we're reading the Word of God from Genesis chapter 1, starting with verse 26 and on down through chapter 2 and verse 3. Genesis 1, 26 to 2, 3. Last time we were together, last Lord's Day, we looked at those first six and a half days of the creation in which God had formed the universe and all that is in it. And then beginning in verse 26, Moses writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these things. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Let's pray. Father, we're standing here with all of the angels and all of the redeemed of all of the ages. And Father, we wish to confess right now that your word speaks to us. And Father, we pray that we would understand that we do not adjust your word to ourselves, but we adjust ourselves to your word by the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we ask that we would do that this morning. Would you give us compliant hearts and spirits? Would you conform us into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I'm really kind of distracted today. It's kind of hard for me to focus because my mind all day long is on my family and friends and acquaintances back in my hometown, Bluxy, Mississippi today, marking the fifth anniversary of when Hurricane Katrina came in and completely uprooted the lives of virtually everybody that I know, leaving just slabs where my grandparents' houses were and destroying the whole landscape of everything that I'd ever known. When Maria and I, after a week of not knowing if my parents were alive or dead, trying to get into contact with folks, when we were finally able to get back down and to drive up and down the beach, I remember having a sense of wondering how in the world is this even possible? This kind of destruction, how can it be this way? This shouldn't happen. This ought not to be that way. People have expressed a similar kind of thought when they've seen a tsunami come through or when they've seen an earthquake come through or when they've seen a mudslide come through and wipe out a home or wipe out a place or wipe out a culture and to say this isn't the way that it is supposed to be. The Bible tells us that that reaction is actually very biblical. This is not the way that it is supposed to be. The Bible instead speaks and shows us a picture from the beginning in which human beings are not at the whim of nature, whether that nature is a hurricane or a cancer cell. That instead, God is creating human beings with a specific place and with a specific purpose and with a power over all of the created order and a stewardship over all of the created order. And so when we read a passage such as Genesis chapter 1, 
we ought to be saying to ourselves as we are reading it exactly what the writer of Hebrews is saying in the passage we read some moments ago. What has happened here? The, the writer of Hebrews says, we know from the Bible that you have put all things under the feet of humanity. And yet we look around and all things are not under the feet of humanity. People are collapsing underneath hurricanes and mudslides and tsunamis. Children are dying from parasites, sapping all of the nutrients away from them. Humanity is not in control of the universe around him, and the question is why? There are many people, when they observe the way that the universe is, they will say, well, that's because humanity is just kind of a freak accident something that just happened along with the other animals and the other mammals that exist on the planet. But the Bible gives a very different picture here of what it means to be human. It says that we were placed here. It says that we were created here. Notice in Genesis 1:26 where we began. Then God said, let us make Man, There is a purpose, there is a planning, there is an intentionality about humanity that God is, is forming and creating. This is not just an accident, this is not incidental, this is the pinnacle of what God is doing in his creation. And so in order to ask what happened, we have to ask what does this mean, what does it mean to be Human. I want you to notice, first of all, that the Scripture tells us something crucial here about humanity created in the likeness of God. Notice what the text says. God says, let us make man. We've seen that kind of language before. God has said, let there be light. Let there be dry land. Let there be vegetation. Let there be fish. Let there be land animals. But something different is happening at this point. He says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Well, the entire rest of the Bible talks about that spends the entire rest of the canon unpacking what that means to be created and made in the image of God. What God is doing here is as he is creating this universe and he is placing someone to govern it and to rule over it in his stead, he creates and he shapes and he forms someone who will picture him a human being that is able to be in communion with God, able to represent God in doing God-like things in governing and ruling over the creation. And this is why the Scripture puts such a high, high value on human dignity. Everything else so far that has been created, God has simply spoken into existence. But when it comes to the creation of the human being, God does something different. Uh, we learn later on in Genesis chapter 2 that God takes the mud of the ground, the dirt of the ground, and he forms together a man, and then the scripture says he breathes his own breath into this matter, into the earth, and so man becomes a living creature. But Bible says here, it is humanity, male and female, created to image and to show something about God. And that is why when there is an assault on human dignity, there is an assault on God. If you found out that a group of our teenagers here at Highview Baptist Church on a trip to Washington, D.C., had spray-painted graffiti on the Lincoln Memorial. There's hardly a person in this room that wouldn't be outraged. And they wouldn't say, well, it's just a piece of, piece of stone. It's just a piece of brick. You would say, you have done something against a symbol of our country. That there's not a person in this room that if you did not see somebody with a picture of the person you love the most, hacking away with it with a knife. 
that you would not say, what are you doing? And the person says, oh, it's just a picture. It's just a photograph. Yeah, it's a picture of my loved one. What are you doing? And the scripture says that when God puts every single human being present in the earth, that every single human being is bearing a dignity that is exemplifying and showing and representing God. So when you come against that person, you are coming against God. That's why James tells us later on, how can you claim to praise God? whom you have never seen. You stand here and you sing, praise Adonai. And yet you turn about the person who is created in the image of God. And what do you do? You use the tongue to defame. You use the tongue to destroy. You use the tongue to tear down. Scripture says that is hypocrisy. God is creating humanity in the image and the likeness of God, which means that every human being bears a dignity and every human being bears a representation of God, which means that there is no human being who can claim any superiority over any human being because all of us are going back to the same source. God creates man in this one man and this one woman and every human being who has ever lived or whoever will live comes from that very same source. There's no such thing as a superior race because there's no such thing as a race apart from the children of Adam, the human race. There's no such thing as a superior class because there's no such thing as a class. People are created human in Adam, and we are all then of one blood. So when there is hatred among one another, what we see is really a hidden and latent hostility toward God who created human beings in this image and likeness. And the Bible tells us why later on, because Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, is the signal of the invisible God. Human beings are patterned and designed after Jesus. So when we do not receive and accept the dignity of another human being, we are assaulting Christ himself. Now notice what that means. What that means is a person's worth and a person's dignity is not the result of how valuable that person is. The woman who is so far gone with Alzheimer's disease that she cannot even recognize anyone anymore bears an inherent dignity and value she is imaging God. The so-called embryo who cannot yet exist on his own bears the inherent dignity and likeness of God. So when there is an assault on that embryo, there is an assault upon God himself. The handicapped person and the disabled person and the homeless person and the, 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 the person who is rejected for whatever reason bears that inherent dignity that starts all the way back here at the very beginning. God says, I will create in our own image, in our own likeness. But what do we want to do? As sin comes in, we don't want to image God. We don't want to remind ourselves that we belong to God. So what do we want to do? We want either to tear down our own dignity, to turn ourselves into simply mammals, and we live and act accordingly as though we have absolutely no power other than the power of our own instincts. There is nobody in this room that expects chastity out of a dog. And what do we want to do? We want to turn ourselves into dogs. How can I be expected to do anything other than this? I'm just an animal. 
or we want to turn ourselves into gods. We don't want to image God. Instead, we want to do what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. We want to create images that reflect ourselves so that we can give glory to ourselves. The ultimate problem here is that we don't want to acknowledge a creator, the scripture says, because ultimately we do not want to give thanks. We do not want to acknowledge I am dependent upon you. But it was not so from the beginning. But notice it's not just the image here, it is also the dominion. Notice what God says. He says, I am going to create them after our own image and after our own likeness, and I'm going to let them have dominion over everything that exists. And then notice what the scripture says in verse 28. God blessed them. He he spoke a word of blessing to them. He, He gave them this joyful freedom that is here. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God speaks from the very beginning of the fact that he delights in and he loves the gift of children. Now, in every single generation since sin has entered into the world, there is always a hatred of children. And why is that? It is because ultimately... We want to idolize ourselves. We want to worship ourselves. So we want to spend our energy and we want to spend our efforts upon ourselves rather than in pouring ourselves out into the next generation. Children then become at best an accessory to have around. And at worst, they become a burden upon a family that you don't want to have, that you don't want to be saddled with, and that manifests itself in so many kinds of twisted ways. We were just at the State Fair the other day, the Kentucky State Fair. They've got a booth there for the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights. Or for... Excuse me, they've changed the name to the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Freedom. Every year at that state fair, I like to line up right in front of that booth with all four of my sons. You can see them scowl. And I like to take out their ice cream money and just start handing their ice cream money out to them right there in front of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Freedom and to see the, the, the difference between these children jumping up and down for their ice cream money and these scowling people who sit over here seeing children as some type of a curse. You know, it's not just the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Freedom that sees children that way. Too often, all kinds of people see children as a hindrance and as a burden, and the next generation is something that is impinging upon my life right now. God does not see it this way. He says the dominion that comes is a dominion that comes as you are being fruitful and you are multiplying. And why is that the case? Because God loves humanity, and he loves the expansion of humanity, and he loves to see the earth filling and multiplying with children. If we are going to be truly human, we will welcome and we will rejoice in children even when those children seem to be a kind of burden to us. And not just the children that are well behaved and not just the children who do the kinds of things we want them to do, but those children who, for instance, come in here to Highview Baptist Church who don't have any parents who are raising them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Children who don't know necessarily how to be quiet or how to walk up and down these hallways without spinning around and carrying on. Uh, We need to cultivate not only those who have children biologically within our congregation, but those that the scripture says are called to be spiritual mothers and fathers to the next generation by mentoring them, by pouring their lives into them. God delights in this. He sees this as being good because he sees people as being inherently valuable. He says, I'm going to bless you. You be fruitful. You multiply. And then notice what he says. He says, I want you to take dominion 
to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. And then he gives a list of all of the things that human beings have dominion over. Now, let me tell you what dominion does not mean. Scripture shows you all the way through the difference between an ungodly kind of dominion that you see with Pharaoh, for instance, and the kind of dominion that belongs to the way of Jesus. Jesus says the Gentiles are the ones who prize power and who lord over one another. I've shown you a different way. And what is it? It's a way of a loving leadership that sacrifices oneself and cares for and manages and subdues and stewards and conserves the working of the ground, the tending of the garden, the protection of the universe that has been given to you. Why? Because unlike a dog and unlike a cat, And unlike a weasel, you will give an account for what you've been given to manage. He says, you work the ground representing me. You have been given this kind of dominion. This is the exact opposite of Darwinism. This says that power is what is ultimately at work in the world, the survival of the fittest. The Bible says, no, no, no. Ultimately, love is what is ultimate at work in the world. God is being represented here by these human beings who are taking dominion and who are working and who are cultivating and who are being fruitful and who are leaving something to the next generation better than what they found it. But when you read this, you ought to notice of all of the things that God says here, you will take dominion over this and this and this and this and this and this. There is one thing missing. You will not have dominion over one another. You have dominion over everything that is created. You do not have dominion over humanity. The problem with us as sinners is that we either refuse to take a stewardly dominion. We think it's here, I'll just use it whatever I want to, I'll just burn it up, and who cares about the generations that are to come after me? Or we think because I've been given dominion over all of these things, I also have dominion over whether or not God has created male and female or I've been given dominion over you, I can take power over you. I can deny that you're even a person. You have no dominion over humanity. We have dominion over the creation. It is limited here. It is given here for these future generations. But when you read this, you ought to have that question, where has the dominion gone? He says here that all of the earth, everything that is created, I am going to put it, God says, all under your feet. Now, why is that the case? Because you are created in the image of God, so the earth is designed to be able to recognize the sons and daughters of God. From the beginning, the earth is there to be able to know these are our rulers. These are the ones who are caring for us. These are the ones who are governing us. What happens when sin comes into the world? The Apostle Paul says now the earth is groaning. The creation is groaning because the creation does not recognize the sons and the daughters of God. They see you and they see me and what do they find? They find people who are imaging Satan rather than imaging God. That is why the image of God is ultimately fully restored in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus stands on the boat and the winds start whipping and the rain starts thundering down, and the boat is tossed everywhere. And what does Jesus do? He stands up and he speaks, be quiet. And everyone says, who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? Do you know who this man is? He is the image of the invisible God, and he is not a rebel against God. He has dominion. He has control. 
But notice finally, it's not only this image and it's not only this dominion, but the scripture ends here with a word about Sabbath. He says, God works every single day creating until he comes here to the sixth day and he creates humanity. And if you were just watching this as it moves along, you would say, well, then what in the world would be next on the seventh day? He keeps moving from one level of complexity to another. And now he's finally here at humanity. What can top that? What will be next after that? And God shows you nothing. And on the seventh day, he does nothing. Why is that the case? Because God is saying to you and saying to me, yes, you will image me. Yes, you will work in those six days just like I have worked. Yes, you are going to have a creativity just like I have creativity. Yes, you're going to represent me to the rest of the universe. But on the seventh day, he reminds us of his holiness. That on the seventh day, he rests. On the seventh day, there is nothing. And God sanctifies this here in verse 2. He calls this holy because on this day, he is resting. He is reminding humanity of our limits. There are many of us in this room who find the Sabbath a very, very hard thing to rest in. We work and 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 we refuse to rest. And why do we refuse to rest? Ultimately, it's because we believe we are Messiah. Everything's going to fall apart if I'm not doing it. If I don't have my Blackberry out, something's going to happen and I'm not going to be able to respond to it immediately. If I don't have the cell phone there, somebody's not going to be able to get me and the entire world order is going to collapse. And then what happens? Your body ultimately shuts itself down. You will take a Sabbath or God will Sabbath you. But why does he do that? He creates in seven days. On that sixth day, he creates man, which is great and wonderful and marvelous. But what does man want to do? Man wants to take that six just short of God's perfection and multiply it into the ultimate. Six, six, six. Man, man, man. I become my own God. I become my own source. I become my own creator. And the minute that happens, God will tear you down. Ultimately, he says, after all of this creation, God is showing you in this rest that ultimately what this is about is a new creation through Jesus Christ. You and I have lost control. We have lost dominion. We have lost the stewardship over the creation around us. The creation is now revolting against us. The creation is now asking, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? And the only way you will ever find the dignity that God has given to you, the only way that you will ever find those glorious limits that God has given to you, is if you learn to rest in the shed blood and the life of resurrection that comes through Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says salvation is all about. It's not just about getting you to heaven. Salvation is about conforming you, Romans chapter 8, into the image of his Son. You are being made into the likeness of the Lord Jesus. And why are you being made into the likeness of the Lord Jesus? So that you can rule with him and reign with him over the universe. And why is God doing this? So that Jesus may be the firstborn among many brothers. If you will acknowledge this morning that you have torn apart God's image in your life. You have squandered the stewardship that God has given to you. 
if you will acknowledge yourself as a sinner and confess, I believe that God has raised Jesus from the dead, therefore he is the one to whom I owe all of my devotion. He is the one that I am going to follow. Father, will you forgive me of my sins? You will be received into the family of God. The dignity that God has given to you will be restored and God will work to shape you and to form you throughout the rest of your life into the resemblance and into the image of Jesus. But you cannot walk in that direction while you are prizing yourself as a God. And you cannot walk in that direction if you are degrading yourself as an animal. God created you with purpose and with dignity and with limits. Find it in Jesus Christ. And in the meantime, Scripture says all of the creation around us of tsunamis and earthquakes hurricanes, shark attacks will continue to taunt. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Why is everything not under your feet? We don't see everything under your feet. But we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Maybe some of you this morning who say, I've been running away from that dignity and I've been running away from that dominion. I've squandered it, but I'm ready to follow after Jesus Christ. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus shed his blood for you. He died in your place. He was raised from the dead in the newness of life and he will receive you if you will come to him by faith. We're going to have men and women up here who are able to talk with you and share with you how it is that you can follow Jesus. I just ask you as we stand here to sing in a few minutes that you just slip out from wherever you are. Come down here and grab somebody by the hand and say, hey, can you pray with me? Can you talk with me privately? And, and, and we'll do that. There may be others of you that God is, is putting something else on your heart right now. Maybe there's something in your life that needs to be repented of, that needs to be thrown away. Maybe there's some challenge in your life that's driving you to despair. Maybe you just need to come and take somebody by the hand and say, would you pray with me right now that I can gain victory over this? Maybe it's somebody in your life that you're burdened for, that you need to pray for. You can pray with someone or just right here at the platform alone. Maybe others of you that God's dealing with in other ways. You need to follow the Lord Jesus in baptism or you need to join this church or you need to make something right with somebody else in the congregation. Whatever it is, as we stand and as we sing, don't leave those things festering. Respond. Father, I just ask that whatever it is that you would like to do in any heart, in any situation, in any seat in this room, if you would do that right now, that you would prompt those people as to what obedience looks like for them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together and as we sing, and if the Lord's prompting you, come.